I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and this week, instead of my patrons voting to talk about a female sovereignty figure from Irish Myth, I have instead elected to talk about a figure who is maybe a sovereignty figure and maybe just an actual real woman who happened to have aspects of sovereignty figures added on to her story after the fact. So that's a quite a large departure, as you may see. Let's talk about Queen Maeve. In the time of ancient gods, warlords, and kings, a land in turmoil cried out for a hero. Maeve. Maeve was the Queen of Connacht. She was the daughter of Ochid Philoch, who was the High King of Ireland at the time, and of Crotan Crov Derg, who was the handmaiden of Atain. That's a that's a character we'll get into in another video. Now Maeve was a ruler of great strategic and political cunning. With a great martial prowess and enormous sexual appetite. So basically like every other example of a good ruler in Irish myth, just a woman instead. Uh, Dahio Hogan had the following to say about Maeve. It is clear that the dramatic potential of portraying her as a sex object was recognised from an early date and that she quickly developed from a symbol of sovereignty into an attractive and cunning woman. Now, I'd like to dispute that. I don't really see Maeve as being depicted as a sexual object, because Maeve, while Maeve does often engage in intercourse throughout the stories, it's always on Maeve's terms, or nearly always, and it's usually done as part of Maeve tricking or manipulating the man in question in some way. It's generally a trap. Or she, she just wants to get off and this is a convenient person. Maeve has an awful lot of sexual agency, is what I'm saying. There's one exception to this, where her ex-husband Cahor forced himself upon her. And yes, that is the same Cahor from the Macha video, who forced a pregnant woman to race his horses. He's... he's... Cahor's dreadful. Cahor McNess is a terrible person. But after this, the, the rulers of Ireland rose up against Cahor for this act. Now, Cahor ended up winning, but the point is that... There was an attempt made to punish him for treating Maeve as a sexual object, and that was one of the few times where she was treated as a sexual object rather than a woman with sexual agency and a strong sexual appetite. So I disagree with the idea that she was a sex object or was intentionally being depicted as one because well, the text doesn't really line up with that interpretation. As I said, Maeve was once married to Cahorn McNassa. She broke it off with him because, well, he was a prideful little shit, and she refused to be married to anyone who was jealous, anyone who was cowardly, and anyone who failed to be generous. Because apparently she had a geish that forbade her from being married to a fuckboy. But all of Maeve's following husbands were all men who were either being awarded kingship of Connacht or trying to attain kingship of Connacht and they ended up marrying Maeve because she said no the only way to become king of Connacht is to marry me. Many academics say that this is evidence that Maeve was a sovereignty figure. Having to marry an embodiment of the land a sovereignty figure is a traditional kingship ceremony in Irish myth and the three qualities she refused in a man are also very much the three qualities of a bad king. However, most sovereignty figures don't take an active 
let alone dominant role in governance the way Maeve does. Maeve's husbands usually become vestigial creatures like a male anglerfish. The male bites the female and latches on. Over time, the two actually fuse together, connecting their circulatory systems. The male, who isn't as good at finding food, gets his nutrition from the female. In turn, she is able to use his sperm when she wants to reproduce. Depending on the species of anglerfish, one female can have several males attached to her. And Maeve has very little association with supernatural powers that you would normally see in sovereignty figures. I think it's more likely that Maeve had managed to establish a short-lived matriarchy within the province of Connacht. A Maeveriarchy, if you will. Maeve was quite a bit cleverer in her attempts to manipulate prophecy than most rulers in Irish men. At one point she asked her druid which of her sons would be the one to kill Cahor. When the druid told her that the son was already born and that his name would be Maine, Maeve, well she didn't have a son named Maine. So she renamed all of her sons Maine just to be sure it would be one of them. Now, however, Maeve had not specified which Cahor exactly she meant, and so it was not Cahor MacNessa, her ex-husband, that was slain by Maine, but a different Cahor altogether. Which is unfortunate. There's two competing ideas on the meaning of the name Maeve. The dominant one is that it has its root in an old Celtic word for mead, you know, the alcoholic drink made of honey, and means the intoxicating. However, this interpretation would require pre-Christian Irish society to have the same incredibly sexually conservative views as the academic who came up with this idea, and, um, no, no, no. One academic named Heinrich Zimmer, who was the very man that originally tied this interpretation of the word Maeve to Queen Maeve, had this to say about I do not intend to collect all the instances of sexual filth that can be found. The readers would be disgusted, for out of all the older literatures known to me of Aryan and Semitic peoples, it is impossible to establish even a remotely similar collection. It has already been noted that the present-day Irish like to compare the Tawn Bokuli with the Iliad, but these can be mentioned in the same breath only with regard to formal narration. Otherwise, an insurmountable gap divides them. Britta Erslinger said of Zimmer's work, For Zimmer, Maeve is a woman who displays an extremely inappropriate behaviour, acting like someone who is insane or drunk, which is also mirrored by her name. It's also worth noting that Zimmer's interpretation of Maeve's name wasn't actually the intoxicating one, but the intoxicated one. Because of course a woman could never use sex as a means to get her way or for her own pleasure unless she was constantly drunk. It was later academics who came up with the interpretation the intoxicating one, building on Zimmer's originally idea, and to be honest... When there's not really much contextual evidence for an interpretation, why would you build on that house of cards? Why? Really? It's very disappointing to me that this sexist and frankly slut shamey interpretation of the name Maeve went unchallenged for roughly 100 years. However, in 2007, George Jean Pinot speculated that it could have come from the root med, meaning to take appropriate measures, and may have meant ruler. The root med is found in several other personal names, like Gaulish Medognatus, he who is used to the appropriate judgment, Medilla and Messilla, and perhaps Old Irish Mess, as in Mess Buchala. Now the thing about this is that the intoxicating one interpretation is very, very much linked to specifically the con consumption of alcohol. I mean, it, it literally comes from the word for mead. 
but there's not actually that much association between Maeve and intoxication. Neither her own intoxication nor her getting others intoxicated in the texts. There is, in the tone, a few instances where Maeve will get people drunk in order to persuade them to fight Ku Cullen, but that's kind of about it. There's not a whole lot of other association there. However, as you've probably gotten the impression already, Maeve was definitely someone associated with taking charge and getting shit done. Or to put it another way, to take appropriate measures. And look, if you and look, if you haven't gotten that impression yet that Maeve liked to be in charge, well let's let's build up a little bit of that with a story. Fado, Fado. Queen Maeve of Connacht was laying in bed beside her husband, Eliel Macmata, and they were talking and joking as couples often do when they lay in bed together. And at one point, Eliel, he turned to Maeve and he said something strange. It is a well-off woman who is married to a nobleman, she is indeed, replied Maeve. Why do you say that? Well, aren't you better off now than you were before I married you? Listen here, you little shit, said Maeve. I was wealthy long before I married you. Well, if you were, this is the first I've heard of it. Sure, weren't you being raided every other day and all of your treasure stolen? I was in me hole! I am Maeve, Queen of Connacht. I am the daughter of Ochud Philoch, the High King, and he from a long line of kings before him. Out of my five sisters, I was the best, the noblest, the most generous, the greatest in battle and at strategy. And for that, I was given Connacht because I had earned it. And I had an army of 1,500 foreign mercenaries and just as many Connacht men and many more besides, and that was only my household guard. There were kings and high kings from all over Ireland begging to marry me, and I would not marry any of them because they were all either jealous or cowardly or, or refused to be generous. And that is why I married you. Because you were none of those things, and I knew you were my equal and would not embarrass me like the others would. And I paid a great dowry. I paid a, a great chariot, the clothing of twelve men, the width of your face in red gold, the weight of your arm in white bronze. And you have no honour price anymore, save what you are worth to me, because you are my kept man. Will you stop? said Elia. My brother is the High King of Ireland, and my other brother is the King of Leinster, and I'm every bit as generous, noble and brave as they are. I came here and married you because I saw a province ruled over by a woman, so I decided to fix it. And besides, how could you get a better wife than the daughter of a high king? Well, I'm still richer than you, said Maeve. So it's you that's dependent on me. That's nonsense, said Ilian. I'm richer than you, you're dependent on me. So they have all of their wealth brought through their vast bedchamber. Not just the, the gold and the silver, the jewels and the tapestries, but everything. Right down to the wooden bowls, the iron pots and pans. They even bring through all of their livestock, horses, goats and cattle. And it turns out that in all of their wealth, in everything they possess, they are perfectly equal. Everything Elil has is in equal value to all of Maeve's possessions and vice versa. Except for one thing. In Elil's cattle herd, there is a great 
mighty noble bull named Finbalach. And nowhere in Maeve's herd is Finbalach's equal. But Maeve is told by her servant that there is a bull in the province of Ulster belonging to a herder named Dara that may be Finbanach's equal, maybe even superior to Finbanach. So Maeve tells her servant to bring eight others and to go to the province of Ulster to find Dara and to offer him in exchange for a year's lend of the Don Cooley. A herd of fifty heifers. And that if Dara brought the Don Cooley to Maeve himself, she would also add a great chariot, a portion of the plain of Maeve equal to his own lands, and the friendship of her own lives. So Maeve's nine messengers, they go to Ulster, they find Dara, and they explain Maeve's offer. And Dara is only too eager to accept this offer to its fullest extent. He is delighted with all of the terms. And so he allows Maeve's servants to have a little bit of a feast by themselves, to, to rest and eat and, and have some fun. And they're, they're eating, and the beef is delicious, the beer is wonderful. And they're drinking, and they're talking, and one of the messengers says, Sure, what a generous host we have here tonight. Is there a more generous man in all of Ulster? Cahor is more generous, I hear, said one of the other messengers. And that is why the Ulster men flock to him and rally around him. Even so, it's very generous for our host to give us the lend of the Don Cooley, and we only nine messengers taking it willingly. What it would take all the four provinces of Ireland to steal by force. Ah, uh, well, said another messenger, it's just as well he did give it willingly, because rallying the other four provinces and that's exactly what Maeve would have done had he not handed it over. And he would not have been able to resist that. Now, unfortunately, Dara's servants, who had been providing them their food and their drink, overheard this. And they told Dara. And he was not best pleased. He took this as almost a threat. And so the next morning, when the servants were making ready to leave, they saw Dara and they said, Dara, why have you not made the Don Cooley ready for travel? Why are you yourself not ready? The Don Cooley will not be leaving Ulster, and neither will I. You tell Maeve, if she wants my bull, she can take it by force, as you said she could. And so Maeve's nine messengers, they returned to Connacht empty-handed, and they explained what Dara told them. And Maeve was not best pleased. And she prepared to take the appropriate actions to get what she wanted. And that is another story. Maeve is a very interesting character. The medieval texts often portray her in quite a villainous light, despite the fact that she rarely does anything any worse than the male rulers and heroes of Ireland, and they are all depicted as being quite heroic. Cahor MacNessa, for example, I have so far only shown the tip of the iceberg of his shift wankery, and he was still consistently portrayed as a heroic figure, but I can't possibly think of any motivations a bunch of medieval monks would have had for betraying a powerful 
sexually liberated woman as villainous. I, I just can't think of one. What's also interesting to note is that Maeve and her stories, well, actually, she doesn't really have many stories. Stories with Maeve in them are fairly plentiful, but she is always a side character in somebody else's story. There aren't many stories where about Maeve herself. And this seems unusual because Cahor has a canon of stories about him, Cuchulain has his own stories, Fionn McCool has his own stories, and for a character as powerful and influential as Maeve, who has many place names named after her, you'd expect there to be a section of Maeve lore, especially within Connacht. I can only assume with all the place names that there was stories at one point, but they have been lost. I can't think of any reason why a bunch of medieval scribes would have been reticent to write down stories of a woman in a leadership position. I, 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 any, any suggestions about that could only possibly be speculation, of course. But if you want to hear more about Queen Maeve, you're in luck. On the 12th of November, which is next week, at 3 o'clock, I will be doing a live stream on Twitch, reading out the entirety of Anton Bohuli and the backstories. I estimate that's going to take me about two days, and I'm doing it to raise money for the movement of Asylum Seekers Island and to help their fight against direct provision, which is a horrible, inhumane, systematically racist policy by the Irish government where refugees are kept isolated while they are having their application approved. And it is horrible. So yeah, if you want to come join in with that and help us fight racism while also hearing about an awesome warrior queen, please come along. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can find out more about that in uh, the cards, wherever they are, and in a link in the description. Have fun. Thank you for watching this video on Queen Maeve. Maeve is one of my favourite mythological characters from Ireland. She's just such a total fucking badass. But um, thanks to all of my patrons, including Killian Ulri, Ash Carp, and all of the other names you see scrolling past here, as well as my other patrons. And thanks to everyone who supports this channel in any way, by watching videos, liking them, sharing them, all of it is very, very, very useful. I'll have a new poll up soon for patrons on what video I should make next. Uh, I'm guessing the result is going to be whatever the most feminist option is, which is not something I'm going to complain about, honestly. And just remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies.